We were the first Delta Company, third of the 187th, because in those days, they had three rifle companies in a battalion, and we were increasing to four. So you start in the first brigade, second brigade, third brigade, then you go first battalion, second battalion, third battalion. So by the time they were getting to my company, they were running ads in daily bulletins saying anybody considered unfit for the United States military will be accepted in Delta Company without question. So Delta Company was made up of about 60 to 70 percent people with stockade time. Another group that came from basic infantry training having failed it. And in those days, you didn't have to walk and chew gum at the same time. Either or, we'd take it, it didn't matter. Going to Vietnam, it was okay. And then another group who had special skills like master's degrees in Elizabethan literature, who were the speech writers for the generals. And then other people like uh, Roy Estrada, who was the captain of the Army pistol team, who could take 245s and put it in a two inch circle. And when he was teaching me and teaching all of us how to fire the pistol, and I was an expert in all the weapons until I got to the 45. And he said, sir, uh, show them how you do it. Let's start at 75 feet. Here's your weapon, fire seven rounds. I, boom, boom, boom. I didn't hit the wood behind the target. He said, let's move up to 50 feet. I didn't hit the wood again. He said, God, okay, 25 feet. And I hit one corner of the paper. He said, sir, we can move to 10 feet, or you can use this by throwing it. <laughs> So it had no rounds in the clip, so I threw it, and by God, I hit the head of the guy every square on. So if you get a 45, that's another way to use it. Um, you heard a little bit about my men, then I'm gonna tell you a little bit why I think they're there. Uh, when they came in, they were considered the losers. Not just the losers of the army, they were losers of society. That's why they were in stockades. They were tough guys. A lot of them were tough. They came from the south side of Chicago, one group, I'll never forget them. And they hung around together, and when I took one of them, I said, you're going to be the squad leader? He said, no, sir. I said, why not? He says, they're lousy, rotten people. These are his friends. I said, but you're one of them. He said, I am too. I don't want to be a squad leader. And that's who they were. And when they came to me at Fort Campbell, I said, we're going to go to the field, and the first thing we're going to learn to do is we're going to run. And if you don't believe it, you're going to run with me, and I knew I could run. I was, in sh I was shaped for them. I could run seven miles, and if they, anybody else was still running, I'd keep running. And we worked, and we worked, and we worked, and we worked so that we wore our hats cockeyed. And I told my men that nothing more than an officer hates is having a salute all the time. So when you're walking across the battalion area, you salute and hold that salute and say, all the way, sir! And if he's on the other side, don't put it down and keep yelling until he salutes back. And pretty soon, Delta got the reputation of being a bunch of jerks. <laughs> and clerks. And it was such that in, when the Chicago Sun-Times came to interview us in Vietnam and no one would come out there, wherever we were, they wouldn't come. The headlines in the Sunday paper was the clerks and jerks of the 101st Airborne Division. It was about us, about what they had done. And they did it through working. We used to go to the jo uh, drop zones. We had that slight mound in the middle, a huge field. And I would practice maneuvers with the company. And I would watch how squad leaders would move their fire teams. And in a huge field, you got to have interval. And I'd make them have an interval of 30, 40 meters, which meant we covered a whole drop zone with a company. But if you can do it in that environment, it's nothing when you get up to each other. But when you got to a rice paddy, my guys, no one would go in the rice paddy. They had the interval on either side. Why do I say that? Look at any film you see out of Afghanistan, of the Taliban, they're behind the military crest. How many know what a military crest is? All right, they're behind the military crest and they got an interval. And you watch the American soldiers, we're in front of the military crest and we don't have an interval. Why? Mount training get all bunched up and ready to go through a door, but before you get to the door, spread out. And that's what we would do, and we worked, and we worked, and we worked at it. And pretty soon, we got the reputation when we got to Vietnam, don't let them in base camp. Bob Hope was coming, and his 
Bob Hope, for those you don't know, was an entertainer. His call sign was Monkey Meat. When Monkey Meat came up on the net, I knew we were going back out through the wire. And that's the way it was. All the time. But when the Padre wanted the chapel, he called us. And I said to a couple of my guys, I said, I need a big mess tent. You got any Marines here? Okay, sorry about this. I said, the Padre needs a chapel. And we need to build him a cathedral. So I need a mess tent. And one of my sergeants said, got it, sir. About four hours later, here comes two choppers with a mess tent hanging between them. They had lassoed the poles and ripped out a Marine Corps mess tent. <laughs> and we put it back up and stacked the things. And I asked the guys, I said, why are you all volunteering for this? And one of the, my men says, we're through the wire so much, sir, I got to figure someone's on our side because you're not. <laughs> And the reason this is important is that unit, the clerks and jerks, Delta Company, third of the 187, who everybody in society has judged losers, and their company commander. I'd come from Stanford University. I'd been to Airborne and Ranger training in a summer vacation between years. But I had not been to Vietnam, and I was the only company commander who had not been there at least once. So to the soldiers, I was a loser. To society and the rest of the division, they were losers. They went on to become, if not the, one of the top two highly decorated units in the United States Army from the Vietnam War. These losers went on to be the best, the true winners. And that's what's important for you to remember. Whoever you're given has the potential to change the world. If I brought all the Medal of Honor guys up here, you'd say first thing, wow, they're old. And they are, except for Sal Gint and two other guys, right? Dakota. Well, Dakota doesn't look so young. He's just big. But if I brought them up here, you would say, and if they weren't wearing uniforms or this blue ribbon, you would say there's nothing special. Nothing. And they aren't. Except one time in their lives, this conspiracy of events and circumstances happened that they said no, as they understand destiny to be. They said, not going to happen today. No way. And they did something. And someone looked at what they did and said, give them a medal. But without the medal, they're no different. They're like you. I got a hero. It's a lady. She got up one morning, go to work. I thought she was wearing a pink dress. I saw a film. She was wearing a black raincoat and a black dress. Doesn't matter. She got up to go to work, go down and catch the bus, got on the bus, walked halfway down that bus and sat down and said, not today. The whole world said Rosa Parks was supposed to go to the back of the bus. And Rosa sat down in the middle of the bus and she could have been killed for that. And you can imagine the violence and the meanness that was in the people's eyes that said, you move to the back. And she said, no, not today. She changed Montgomery, she changed Alabama, she changed the United States, she changed the world. And nobody gave her a medal. Nobody gave her a medal. Why? She couldn't explain it. She didn't do it the day before and she didn't do it the day after. It just happens. Someone reaches into their gut and finds this potential to challenge fate and changes it for themselves and hopefully for others. So when you're out leading your men, women, look at them. Not a, oh my God, how did I get this person? They're yours. And if you take them into combat, they're yours for life. I know, I still get calls from my kids. They're 50 years old and they're calling me for help. Some of them, my mistake. I didn't process a medal for them, like an air medal. And they want to have it for their grandkids. Others, like Calvin Heath, who's mentioned in my citation, I told him to turn your radio off and play dead. I'll save you. I'll get you out if I can. The NVA was all over the place. Calvin says, see you in the morning, sir, and click off goes his radio. He's cut off from us. The NVA sit on him and eat breakfast the next morning. He was so badly wounded, they figured he was dead. And he was laying across his lieutenant to save him. Calvin got recommended for the Silver Star and the Purple Heart. 
His wounds were all in his back because a claymore went off, an enemy claymore. And in order to save him in the morning, he took his bayonet and killed the two NVA that were sitting on him. But the general was too busy to file the papers we had sent in to give him his silver star and his purple heart. And because there was nothing in his DD-214, everybody thought he was a liar and nuts. So he said to hell with it and left and went AWOL. And in order to not be prosecuted, he signed away all rights, all veterans' benefits. He called me 40 years later and said, sir, I'm going nuts. I need a counselor. I said, Calvin, go to the VA with your silver star and your purple heart. You're going to be like the second coming of the Messiah. He said, sir, I ain't, I ain't got no silver star. I didn't get no purple heart. And I ain't got no VA benefits. Because an officer was too lazy to follow up. And that was me. I should have called the general's office and said, did you take care of my men? But I didn't. Failed. I have 10 men on a wall. Why? I didn't do perfection. And that's your job. Not almost perfection. Perfection is what you're held accountable for. Five elements of leadership. Five. You're studying duty. It's not an element of leadership. That's about leadership. Duty is what you're obligated to do. Why? You gave your oath, you gave your honor, duty honor. Why? For country, not for yourselves. That's where it comes from, duty honor country. But what about leadership? What's it take? 20 years ago, I was asked to give a speech at the Merch Marine Academy. We got five minutes. Merch Marine Academy, 2,000 people in a room. They told me to speak about the history of the Merch Marine. I didn't know anything about the Merch Marine, so I studied and I had it nailed. I was gonna nail them with it. And a kid, 18 years, no, 21 years old, he was their first captain, introducing me, he says, tonight, to 2,000 people, by the way, in black ties, you know, this, I'm on the stage, will speak to us about the elements of leadership. I leaned over by the microphone, I was like, no, hey, son, I'm doing the history of the Merchant Marine. And that son of a gun took his hand off the mic and says, not tonight, sir, we want to know what you think about leadership, not what you might read someone else thinks. First reaction was, damn. <laughs> Second reaction is, we're in pretty good shape. <laughs> if that's what our new young officers are going to be, we're in pretty good shape. I came up with five things, and I want you to remember these as you're doing it. Five things that night. And, it look, and I can tell you now, anybody that reads military books, uh, Musashi uh, Mashori, who wrote a book in Japan called The Five Rings. You ought to read it. It's all about this. All right? It's all about that Sun Tzu. It's all about this. But my five are a little bit different. First one is honor. Everything in leadership is honor. Everything is honor. Why? If they don't trust you, they don't follow you. If they do trust you, they do follow you. But if they're not, and they don't, you're not leading. You look over your shoulder and you're all alone. So honor is what it's about. And if you want to find out who can tell if you're lying, ask a snuffy sitting on a rock. Find an E1, E2, or E3 and say, hey, do you trust me? He'll look at you and say, no. <laughs> they, won't, they won't bet around. They know it before you know it. I had it here at Benning. I was in ranger school. And the head ranger said, we're here on a map. And I said, sir, in all due respect, you're not. You're here. He said, OK, who wants to go with Buca? You go with him. Who wants to go with me? Come with me. Well, Three of my 12 guys went with me. The others went with him. We were sitting in there drinking Cokes when he got there. From that moment on, no one trusted him. And he's now a really good friend of mine. <laughs> so honor is what it's based on. Don't forget that. Honor. And no half-truths. Honor. Integrity. Second, confidence. You've got to have the guts to stand up and say, I'll do it. Follow me. That's what you're at. Fort Follow Me. That's what we used to call it. That's what this is about. No hiding behind the scenes. Someone says, I want someone to be charged. You raise your hand and say, let me. Because if you're not that, someone else will do it. Integrity. Confidence. Competence. You better know what the hell you're doing. 
and none of this GPS BS. You better know how to read a map because when the satellite goes out, you're toast. So you got to know to fire your weapons, take care of your equipment, just like your code says, but I mean it all. Every weapon in your charge. Confidence. Compassion. Number four, compassion. Why? They're all humans. They're not machines. And there's no problem reaching out and hugging a person and saying, you're all right. I know of the sergeant that was sent over with Special Forces Reserve as a medic. First gut shot he saw, he fainted. All the fancy dance in our army wanted to court-martial him. Until a sergeant major visited him, said, how are you doing? And the kid started crying. He said, I never thought it would be that bad. And this sergeant major who had never seen him before hugged him and let him cry. And he said, son, you want another chance? He said, yes. And he worked his butt off to get him a second chance. He went on to be a decorated medic in the special forces. Why? One man had the courage to hug him and listen and care. And the last element is humility. If you are standing in front of men and women who belong to someone else, someone else, they are the most prized possession on earth. And they are entrusted into your loving and caring hands and your integrity compassion and experience for safeguard and that doesn't make you humble get rid of that uniform and get on to another job because that cockiness will lead someone to be killed those men and women in your command are someone's mother father brother sister son daughter niece nephew and someone else loves them with all their heart but they're yours to train and safeguard and to care for and to not treat them as a number but as a person and lead them with confidence, with competence, compassion, humility, and most of all, integrity. God bless you all for what you're doing for me and for us. I wish you luck. Anything I can ever do for you or your unit, you let me know, I'll be there. I don't go to fancy things, I go to where soldiers are. God bless you, and from one old soldier to a bunch of new ones,